come and dream with me. Hello and welcome to What Do You Want to Watch? The Explosion Network's premier media podcast. Every fortnight we get together to talk about movies, TV, and online content and let you know that I have never played a tree in anything. Uh, just in case you're wondering. I'm your host, Ashley Hobley, and joining me this episode is Dylan Blight. I didn't do any school plays in school. So no tree there. Also, no tree. Nicholas Pryor. I once played the Grim Reaper in a stage production of The Little Mermaid. <laughs> is he a character in that? I uh, know. <laughs> cool. All right, it's we got those things where they've got to have a role for every kid, so they just throw everything in there. Yeah. So instead of I'm, possibly a fish or like a talking crab, no, I went around with a scythe tapping all the fish, and they died. <laughs> it's my kind of play. Uh, We've got a big episode. We're going to be talking about what's in our watch history. We'll be talking, covering a bunch of news, and then we'll be talking about the movie we ended up watching, which this episode is The Apartment. Uh, but let's kick things off. Uh, sort of recap some stuff that we talked about in the last couple of weeks, but other people have seen since. Uh, Nick, you went and saw Spider-Man Far From Home. Yep. The final Marvel movie in the Infinity Saga. You're a big Spider-Man fan. Uh, how do you feel about it? I enjoyed it. And as much as I really enjoyed it and I love Mysterio as a villain, I also can't help but feel like it was just another Marvel movie in the same vein as well. Kind of like conflicting opinions, I guess. Oh, I wouldn't rank it as a top tier Marvel movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, me and Dylan have talked about it extensively at this point. Uh, you can check out our review discussion at ExplosionNetwork.com or on last episode, we talked about it briefly as well. But yeah, I think there, there is a bit of an issue that it's getting to a formulaic point where yeah, it, it is 21 movies in to this thing and it doesn't do a hell of a lot different to anything else we've seen so far. I just really hope the next, I guess, saga, if you want to call it, shakes it up a bit. I guess. I don't know. I don't know if it will. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd probably wishful thinking, but yeah. Yeah, more than anything else. We might know more about this by a day after this episode posts. Possibly. There is, at Comic-Con, there's a Marvel panel, so we're expecting at least announcements or confirmations of stuff we already know. I would suspect. Uh, and then, Dylan, you went and saw yesterday... How, how do you feel about that Dude. movie? <laughs> <laughs> you know how I feel about it. And you bring it up on this fucking podcast still because you just want me to say how I feel. Uh, the, the, it, here's how I feel about this movie. As I watched it, I enjoyed the process, uh, although it got worse as it went along. And then the more time I spent away from the movie to think about it, the less and less I liked it. <laughs> I think is how I'll describe it. Um, the acting's really good. The the music's good. The writing is okay. Uh, mainly held back by nonsensical ways in which it takes its weird oh, sci fi movie. Yeah, it takes its it, it takes its theme or whatever in weird directions for unnecessary re- reasons that just complicates and makes the whole thing even weirder when they should have just kept it as simple as it was to start off with, and that would have been perfectly fine. Um, and then also Danny Boyle does several camera angles throughout the whole fucking movie that I could not escape from ahead, and it just makes me think that Danny Boyle was really bored, and he was like, you know what? I know they're just walking down the street or whatever here, but let's just throw in this wacky camera angle for shits and giggles. And it made me look around the whole entire cinema, entire cinema and be like, what, what? And I was watching it with Kieran. I look over at Kieran. He's like oblivious. But meanwhile, I'm having a fucking panic attack in my seat being like, why are these camera angles happening? <laughs> um, why isn't the horizon straight? Yeah, it's it it fucking weird, weird. Weird stuff happens in the movie. But when it comes down to it, it's just a rom-com no, we're not the, the, it just a seems to me movie, the premise of the movie is what if the invention are lying but the Beatles? The premise of the movie is basically 
I mean, without going deep into spoilers, it's just a love story to the Beatles. A- a- alongside a love story for the Beatles inside the movie. It's a love story yeah, the- crossed with a Beatles movie, crossed with a, mu- by a musical biopic. Yeah, but it's like the, the Beatles stuff is heavily, heavily handed in the, look, the Beatles are one of the greatest bands, if not the greatest band to exist, and we need their mu- music to exist, and what would happen in a world where it doesn't exist, um, it would still need to exist for reasons, and I, I, I don't know. It's it's a Netflix film. If you watch on Netflix, it's a, I would say it's a fine afternoon, maybe. Like If I had to give it a score, I'd probably give it a... 5.5, I think, is where I, I would go at. Yeah, it's pretty harsh. Uh, so I'm only a couple of hours removed from this film that I saw in the cinema. I went and saw Booksmart. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, we did a rev- trailer reacts back in March when it was debuted at South by Southwest. Um, pretty positive of it. Uh, then it came out in back in May over in the States. Uh, pretty much two girls on their last day of school realize that they've all the kids that they uh, who focus completely on school studies uh, f- re- come to learn that all the kids who partied and other stuff also got into the same top end universities they did. So they aim to go to a high school party to sort of make up for their lost time. Uh, this is a brilliant film. Uh, I think Caitlin Caitlin Diva and uh, Beanie Fieldstein are the two leads. They're incredible. Uh, they've got this is star making turn uh olivia wilde does a fantastic job it's shot beautifully some of the cinematography is some of the best i think i've seen but in a comedy it's, in a while in case people are like olivia wilde what, yeah what uh she's the director olivia wilde director is the director debut. in her yes. directorial <laughs> debut um yeah it's uh and the other standout is billy lord who just pops up constantly as this uh interesting i guess hippie sort of character i guess uh, just well, gonna... hold on. Let, me put, let me put a question on you yes. for the Billy Lord thing. You don't watch American Horror Story. No, I don't. Do you? Okay, yeah, because Billy Lord is a consistent member of American Horror, Horror Story at the moment, and she has proven to be able to play a variety of roles. So, yeah. Maybe it's more surprising, I guess, for you than. Oh, uh, no, I wouldn't say it was super surprising. It's just I hadn't seen her much in. Seen her in a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so okay. this film has been touted as uh, the new female Superbad. I can see the similarities, I guess, but uh, it sort of is a bit more feminist and emotional. Um, to be fair, about probably a third in, I'm like, oh, this is pretty a generic standard uh, high school comedy. But yeah, it's it, it elevates itself towards the end. So uh, definitely worth seeking out if it's playing in a theater near you. I hate you so much. I mean, I can't help where you live. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and get a review by the time this is up, so check that out. Uh, Nick, I saw that you what uh, you finished season two of Barry. How are you feeling about that show? Yeah, really good. I'm really excited to see the next one. But obviously, next year it'll come out. But I really encourage everyone with the means to, to check it out. It's easily digestible and I think one of my top shows of the year so far. Cool. Definitely, definitely worthy of the Emmy love again this year. Is it better than yes. season one? Or I think so. Yeah, yeah, much better. Cool. Uh, Dylan, I saw that you watched uh, the Jonah Hill directed film, uh, mid nineties. I did. How was that? It's, uh... The skateboarding film. You're a skater boy. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it's. I suppose it's easy to describe it as that, but it's not really a skateboarding movie because it never really focuses on, like, it doesn't have, like, massive skating scenes and it never has any, like, massive, man, skating makes me feel so free. And, like, it's it's more about the it, the kids and the skating just so happens to be the, what they do and connects them, I guess. But, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, obviously, because Jonah Hill directs it and this is his directorial uh, debut. And... Uh, it's not a comedy at all. It's a drama slash uh, very serious drama, I guess. <laughs> I guess. There's like barely any parts that you could laugh about. Uh, it's got all these great kids that star in it, including... Um, oh, fuck it. I have to find his name. Uh, the, it's from God of War. Uh, Sonny Sajik, Sajik, or however you say his yep. last name, is a kid who played... Uh, Atreus. Oh, fucking God of War. Atreus oh, in the God of War video game. If, yeah, yeah, boy. Uh, so that's who... 
uh, plays the main character in this. And then Catherine Watterson plays his mom and Lucas Hedges plays his brother. And he has this kind of dysfunctional uh, family life where his brother, his older brother is basically picking on him and bashing him all the time. Um, his mother isn't really there a lot kind of thing. So um, one day he's out and about and he sees all these kids skateboarding and, you know, they're caught there. Some shop owner's trying to tell him to fuck off and he sees like these kids still the shop owner like, get fucked, man. And here's this like, I don't know, I suppose he's supposed to be like 12 year old, this kid, I guess. And he sees all these like older teenagers, I guess, doing all this stuff. He's like, they're kind of cool. So he starts, he walks into their skate shop and sees them all chilling and uh, all of a sudden he wants to buy a skateboard. So he manages to get himself one. And he just starts hanging out with uh, at the skate shop and uh, growing into this relationship with all of these uh, kids that all uh, run at the skate shop. Most of them, I think it was when I clicked for all their IMDb's, most of the kids was like, this is their first movie or whatnot. So um, that was quite good because all of them feel authentic, I guess is the word to describe it for what it is. And then the other thing that makes this movie feel really good is it's shot as if it came from the fucking 90s. So it's like four by three, not widescreen, um... I read in the trivia that apparently when they screened it somewhere, uh, the projectionist apparently like walked up to Joan Hill or something and was like, hey man, it's really great that you found this movie from the 90s and you're trying to, and you're releasing it finally or something like that because he thought it was a, a legit, <laughs> this <laughs> movie that they'd randomly found that was never released or something. Because uh, yeah, it definitely looks the the part and time that's set in. Um, I feel like if you've watched any of these sorts of movies before um, where young kids growing up in a certain place, bad family life. You can sort of probably predict how it's all going to play out and, like, it, it hits all the similar notes that other movies like this do. Like, um, oh fuck, I, was, I can't remember that one, but it's set in New York called Girlhood. No, not Girlhood, Boyhood, not Boyhood, something like that. Jeez, I can't remember now, but um, it's, it's similar sort of notes. Uh, the one thing I'll say is it's... I wouldn't call it brave, uh, but uh, the, Joan Hill and the screenwriters, I guess, made the choice not to back away from certain slangs and terms and like the way people would talk to each other back then. Um, so there's a lot of you're gay, this, hey, F word, you know, like constantly kind of being thrown around and stuff like that. So um, that was kind and you obviously wouldn't see anything like that show this now if it was set during current day so watching that it felt a bit abrasive somewhat um but i i really really enjoyed it and the, it felt really it felt really real especially because like when i was skating i know this is hard to i have to at least someone bring this up not to do the, the thing but like uh th this film sets up this thing where there's like everyone kind of has their crew i guess and like you'd go to skate park and everyone has their like click and their their things and stuff and i found that part like to be especially relatable because they at one stage go to a party and like everyone's there in their own thing and i'm like the kid like the kid who's sunny's playing is like 12 or whatever and back when i was skating i had like i mean i was like 16 i think the oldest person i hang out with that would hang around their group all the time was like maybe 17 18 but we also had like a 12 year old that would constantly hang around with us so i found it like this really weird like <laughs> <laughs> um art imitating life thing so um i wouldn't say you have to be into skateboarding to enjoy it though but it's it's really good and really interesting just from the joan hill aspect i suppose to see like w what kind of stories he's interested in telling even though he's a known as a comedian cool definitely would you say that is it i just rented off itunes it came out recently cool uh, Nick, I saw that you watched the first episode of Nosfer Artu, star uh, the adaptation of the Jody Hill, no Joe Hill, Joe Hill, yeah, uh, novel. Uh, yep. You only watched one episode, so I get a feeling I know how you feel about it. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, I quite enjoyed it. I just haven't had a chance to go back and continue watching it because it's a show that I had watched. Well, my wife was out one night, but I haven't really had a chance to watch the rest of it alone. So, yeah, I quite enjoyed it. It's a quite an interesting premise. What's it's the premise? Like a, uh, well, only from the first episode that this guy, which from the title card is a vampire and he's abducting 
people and children mostly and taking them to a place called Forever Forever Christmas or Christmas Land it's called. It's I don't know a whole lot about it just from the one episode, but it's drawn me into um continue watching it at least and I kinda like quite like what Joe Hill does too, which for those who don't know is Stephen King's son as well. Mm. So yeah. I'll probably continue watching it when I get the chance to. Is it a Nightmare Before Christmas tie-in? No. Shame. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dylan, I saw you finally got around to watching Sorry to Bother You, the Boots Riley <laughs> film. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you I love for, that Nick? movie. Yeah, well, I, I, I watched it uh, thanks to your means. Um, the it's, it's really not illegal weird. for those who are wondering. No, not for not not illegal, but Nick purchased it on a, a thing. Um, it's really weird. It's as weird as the trailer probably makes it. it, it well, put it this way: weirder than if the you trailer. thought the trailer was weird, it is weirder. <laughs> 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 and I feel like I honestly feel like there's a point in the movie where, uh. Like, if you're on board from the start, especially if, if if you've watched the trailer and you're like, yeah, I'm into this weird tone, this weird kind of thing. Because in case you, you don't know, I guess the easiest way to set it up, the synopsis of the movie is basically this guy. Um, oh, fuck. What's his name? What's the main actor's name? Uh, God damn it. I need to find it now. Cause, from Atlanta, right? Sorry. Uh, like Heath Stanfield. Also, That's Death Note, I guess. Uh, or... Um, get out, whatever else. He's in a heap of stuff. Like Keith Stanfield. I was like, I read in the trivia. Apparently, this was originally supposed to be played by Donald Glover, but he had to pull out to go do Star Wars. So oh. he suggested that his uh, friend from Atlanta be the person to play the role. So there's a, apparently a little bit of trivia for it. it worked out quite well. Yeah. Um, so his name is Cassius Green, and he gets his job at this telemarketer firm. And he gets told to put on a white person voice <laughs> to sell stuff. So he puts on this white person voice. Uh, and his white person voice is done by... Um, who does his? Uh, David actually? Cross. Da- yeah, David Cross does his. And like Pat Oswald does, does someone yeah. else's later in it as well. Uh, so David Cross does his white person voice. And he starts ringing up all these people. And he's doing really well in these sales. And it, I, I guess that's the main way to set it up without going heavy into other things. If, but if, if that idea alone isn't weird... It gets way weirder. And there's a certain point at about an hour into the movie, hour 10-ish, I don't, I don't know, like the after the first two-thirds, I guess, of the movie, it, t- it goes into its last part is bonkers. And I feel like if I feel like for a lot of people, they're either going to be okay with what happens and the way the movie goes, or they're going to be like, no, <laughs> this, is, this is it. I can't play along with this anymore. But for me, I... I was 100% bo- uh, on board until the end. It's, I mean, throughout the entire movie, I would say it was never really trying to hide its message yeah. at all. Uh, and it, it was always like right on the surface. You could clearly see what the director, um, director, writer, slash writer, uh, fuck, what's his name? Boots He's from, um, yeah, Boots Rider. You could, exa- you could see exactly what he was trying to say. And it just so happens to be in that last third of the movie that he takes what he wants to say into overdrive and really kind of nails it uh, into you. And you're even going to be okay with that or you're going to be like, no, this is too weird. I'm out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I think it was really enjoyable. And also um, the, the cast all around is really, really great. Yeah. So you got the, like he Sam feels great. Um, Tessa Thompson's really great as his um, girlfriend, but she's also like this activist and she's constantly has like we- these massive weird, earrings or whatever she's making throughout the movie and she's like into art and all this sort of stuff and she's she's interesting and then also uh, like Terry Crews plays his uncle and uh, Danny Glover plays it shows up for a little bit as one of the people that tells him how to do the white voice uh, Army Hammer's in it as a weird character <laughs> um, and then also oh where's like, he where is Glenn he uh, what's, Dead. yeah Glenn from The Walking Dead uh, Stephen Yoon uh, is also in it as one of the main characters as well so yeah uh, Really cool movie, I think. Yeah. I'm interested to see what uh, Boots Riley does next, since this was his first film uh, out for movie. I also looked up, apparently, this is like the, the all the music that's using this is from his days back, uh, from his group back in the day, oh. which, yeah, I can't remember the name of now, but 
Um, weird movie. <laughs> <laughs> weird but wonderful. Weird but wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so over the last few weeks, I've been slowly working my way through a big TV series. Don't say slowly. Yeah. Every time you've I log got- on, you've watched about 20 episodes. Don't, you've got through it in record time. <laughs> Probably. Uh, I watched all five seasons of Gotham. Uh, the... Oh, that isn't what I was talking about. <laughs> no, yeah. We'll talk about that next episode. Uh, yeah, I watched all five seasons of Gotham, the Batman prequel series uh, that follows uh, Jim Gordon in his earlier days in the Gotham City Police Department um, and slowly sees a bunch of his Batman's villains surface over the years. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think it is pretty solid. It is pretty good. Um, uh, I noped out at the Balloon Man episode. That was the wasn't that the premiere of like season two or something? No, it was or? like episode three or four of the first okay, season. Yeah. I I I noped out the episode after that. I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you didn't give it really much of a chance. <laughs> To be fair, I, it, it how, wasn't deserving of a chance. <laughs> how much of a chance is literally like a, a whole season, which is 20-something episodes, plus a couple into more? That is well enough of a fucking TV show. I don't know. I feel like it definitely starts off as a police procedural with a couple of serialized storylines, um, but I feel like it does get better as it goes along. Um, of course, I'm inclined to like Ben McKenzie, obviously. I joined him back in the day in the OC and that sort of thing. Uh, they introduced Morena, uh, Morena Baccarin as a uh, uh, Lee Thompson uh, later in the season. I was about to say Doctor whatever her name yeah, is. Yeah, she's great. Um, I really there's I like Donald Logue as uh, Harvey Bullock. He's very amusing. Um, and I do think they do. The, they obviously have Br- young Bruce Wayne and Selena. Throughout the series, they they have an on and off again relationship and that sort of thing. I think they round out a lot of the villains very well. Except the only issue with throughout is they kind of uh, they constantly are double crossing each other. So they're always mixing and matching and constantly coming back to each other, which feels a bit odd. But I guess that's, isn't what they do in the comics anyway. That is what they do in the comics. So I guess it makes sense in that regard. Um, I enjoyed the last season. They took uh, a storyline from the comics. Sort of, and really explored it, which I didn't expect them to. <laughs> uh, How big a spoilers can we do, really, for this thing? Didn't they do No Man's Land or yeah, something? Yeah, they did No Man's Land for the last season. So Okay, so I'll, I'll open up the spoilers, because I because every now and then I, I see news stories for it, and I'll just, I'll just, just have read, a read exactly what happens. Cause, yeah, because I'm, I'm not going to watch it. I'll just sometimes see like pictures of Bane and shit. And I'll be like, oh, Bane's in Gotham now. Let me yeah. have a look and see what's happening. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really pretty enjoyable. I do have a couple of issues with the last episode. Obviously, they do, they, for the last episode, they do like a 10-year time jump um, to yeah, make up the what, time what where it, Bruce Wayne has left Gotham before he becomes Batman's Batman. would villains be seniors by the time he's Batman? Well, they're, they're, you know? Yeah, a bit older, but... but I Batman just looked up the old. design of Bane in Gotham, and that is fucking awful. Yeah, it's not great. Um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. One of the is- only issues is they recast Catwoman because obviously they had to because of the ten year time jump. But other than that, it's it's this, a fine. This episode. is my problem. So I read what happens in the finale. Yes, I don't appreciate a show's last episode basically not featuring its cast members who have been there the entire fucking show. Yeah, it is a bit odd. It's a yeah. <laughs> it's it's a weird send off. Um, and then the other person I just want to bring up is, a, um, what's his name? Hang on. Cameron Monaghan, who plays, uh, Jerome Valeska and also Jeremiah Valeska, which is the Joker proxy. Um, I think he does a fantastic job. He's very, uh, good in the role and, uh, I don't like his look in the last episode, but that's, what are you going to do? Other than that, he, he, he does look and sound like a very classic Nicholson Joker. So, what do you mean Joker proxy? Well, it's not clearly defined as the Joker. Well, let, let me I'm not going to spoil it because I feel like it's obviously a big spoiler. But when the show finished, I had to look up 
what the dealio was with this Joker. Because it, I always kept seeing news stories being like, is it the Joker? Isn't it Joker? And then he'll die and he'd be back. And year after year, I kept seeing him. I'm like, what? what is going on? He keeps going and coming back. So when the show finally finished, IGN or somewhere put up this article. It was like the full history of Gotham's uh, Joker. And I read through it and that fully explained what happens for that show with the Joker. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> what a confusing fucking mess this is. There's one key point where, don't you, mm, there's fucking- It was fine oh, when I you watched, well, maybe it was fine for me where I watched five seasons all in one go. Ash- a- Ashley liked season eight of Game of Thrones. <laughs> That's true. It- it's solid. Yeah, you were going to say? <laughs> I mean, I- from what I read, it was weird, but- I don't know. Sure. Just from my perspective, from the whole inception has been a mess the whole time. No, it was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Uh, so let's move into the mandatory Netflix segment of the show. And the big Netflix show that dropped in the last two weeks was the season- Last of the Czars. Yeah, that did come out. I don't know if it's got as much of an impact as this show. Uh, Stranger Things season three. Oh, that one. That one, yeah. The one with the kids. and the. <laughs> um, well, me and Dylan have already done a review discussion, uh, but Nick, I would love to hear your thoughts, uh, seeing as you only just finished it recently. so I did. I finished the last episode today. Um, I really enjoyed it. I think it's the best of the three seasons, personally. That's good, because you're We're in agreement. joining. We're all in agreement. We're all in agreement? Yep. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. I liked the is it because there was more Russians this time? No, I don't even think that was that major of a plot point. I was more um, interested in the whole the mind the mind flayer coming over and all that kind of stuff, and just the kind of like how the characters split into three distinct groups and the way they interacted with each other and their stories diverged and come back together again. But yeah, no, I really enjoyed it, and I liked it. wasn't really concerned or really had anything to do with the upside down i guess as well but yeah um it did i'm also kind of in two minds i kind of wish i had more answers to some questions as well but it didn't really detract from it in the end for me so i really enjoy it dylan do you want to start with your thoughts Best season of Stranger Things. It Copy made cat. me want to go. Made me want to go back and watch the first season, uh, especially after a season two where I was kind of, well, not even kind of. I was massively let down. Season two, yeah. I feel, and maybe if season two had been the first season quality wise, it would have been like, okay, this show's pretty decent, and then you'd be fine. But after season one, I was not the biggest fan of two. Uh, so I find this a return to form and a, a big, <laughs> if uh, once again, a really good example of sometimes rushing out your second season to get it out a, a year after a successful show isn't always the smartest move. Take time off, work on scripts, work on stories, do what you need to do. Unless you get uh, Thrones. Unless you get, well, no, let's be honest, they, <laughs> they didn't take, they, they, they took a holiday and still yeah. wrote that shit. In to be fair, time. the one taking uh, his time is Robert J- George Railway Martin. If you had to finish the books in time, then it w- we wouldn't be having these problems. We got a kneeler over here, everyone. A kneeler. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, new characters that were introduced this season were great, uh, like Robin, and then also characters that were introduced last season, uh, like Max and her brother, who had no purpose really last season, I felt personally really felt like they made a lot more sense this season. It felt like they were put to better use. It, it honestly just feels like the Duffer brothers took on all the criticism and stuff from season two and uh, worked on it. And now we've got season th- three, which is really great. And the, like the biggest criticism I have really of the whole season is I do feel like it's um, the stuff Nick was saying before with the most separated in their groups. I'm like, that kind of worked for the first two seasons somewhat, I guess. But in this season, it just felt like formulaic. Organic. And a, yeah, you know, it's just like, <laughs> and after the first episode, we got to split them off, and then by the final episode, they all come back together. Like that was the only one massive problem I had, but uh, you know, I, I absolutely loved it, and I can't wait to see where it goes to season four now. Um, 
And my, I got my um, parents onto starting the first season because I wouldn't shut up talking about it. <laughs> so <laughs> I was sitting out there, I was sitting in the lounge the other day re-watching the first couple episodes because they started it. <laughs> Effective. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this season as well. Um, I really love, obviously my favourites of this, the, the Dustin, Steve and uh, Robin and Erica. Team. Team. Uh, yeah, I think I've said it before, but the Erica Steve bathroom scene, probably one of my favorite scenes of the year so far. Uh, I think it was just perfectly acted. Um, and I suspect we'll be seeing a lot more of Maya Hawk and different things, uh, in the coming years. Uh, well, she's in Once Upon a Time in a, um, yeah, oh, okay. as well, apparently. Interesting. So. That makes sense. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think it's probably grosser than last year, especially with the Mind Flayer stuff. I think that sort of played out, yeah, grossly. I think, I think, effects wise, it looked pretty impressive sometimes, and then other times it's a bit hit and miss. Uh, uh, what this season? I thought this, this season. season looked way better. Yeah, than I, previous I, seasons. I, I just feel I like some of the stuff in the last like episode I... didn't quite match up in different shots. But yeah, other than that, it's pretty good. Uh, there was one of the, there was another gross thing in the finale, which I felt like wasn't needed. Or you would say that though. That's Meanwhile, true. I'm over here like, yes, duffers, embrace your horror. Re- return, yeah, like, put embrace those horror fingers horror further stuff. in. <laughs> yes, I was enjoying yeah, I how much. Because really well, the previous seasons were like more 80s, uh, goony level of like, it's kind of like scary, but not like horror. Whereas this season, they were embracing a little bit more of the body horror stuff. Not to the point it would be rated MA or R or anything obviously ridiculous, but. I was enjoying how much further they were pushing the envelope, I guess. Yep. Uh, and the only other thing is the product placement, I feel like, has been brought up a fair bit around the show. Uh, there is a long monologue about New Coke, which feels very out of place and weird. Um, and then there's a bunch of Slurpees constantly throughout the entire show. They even show up at a 7-Eleven, so I don't know if there's some sort of endorsement deal there, but uh, I... It wasn't, didn't feel too on the nose, uh, but maybe people are a bit more sensitive to that than I was. You guys feel that at all? I I don't even understand. I understand that they're talking about New Coke because it was a thing at the time, and that was a, that would be a conversation kids would have with each other. How can you drink that shit? But yeah, I didn't notice Sloopies at all, but I think that's kind of a generic thing that it's not that much of a product place in any way. Yeah. I uh, Slurpees are in so many American movies that I don't think I blinked an eye at the Slurpee stuff. The Coke thing just felt like a they were taking advantage of this time period and place to just have fun with the the fact that the new Coke thing was happening. And I don't feel like it was a weird weird product placement. It felt like an, a natural time to I, take advantage yeah, of this thing. It, they're even odd product placements because it's not like you can go out and buy new Coke now anyway. Well, you can. They, oh, can you? I thought they did it. Sure. They oh, re-released okay. it for the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, to show how out of touch I am. <laughs> but yeah. Is there anything season three? We're all looking forward to a potential. Uh, season, season four season four definitely coming, Nick? Oh, they would have to. Especially with that after credit scene or mid credit scene or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Dylan, I saw that you've watched a bunch of Netflix stuff, so we'll quickly go over that. Uh, you on. watched... The first part of Black Mirror Season 5, Striking Vipers. Yeah, it was shit. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, Nicholas? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. That's my review. No, I, I, I know everyone kept talking down on this latest season, like there's three episodes. Uh, I'll watch them all anyway because it's Black Mirror and I'll... You know, I'll judge them all for myself. But the quality of the first episode didn't make me want to rush through the... The next two, uh, it just, it felt weird. It felt badly written. It's just, just felt odd. I, I've seen a lot of people say that this isn't real Black Mirror. And I, that's not what my problem with it is because Black Mirror has always had heaps of different sorts of genres and stuff. And literally the first episode of the fucking show is about the prime minister fucking a pig. Spoilers. So the show is very weird um, and it tackles interesting themes and stuff. But the first episode is just just put together weird it just felt oddly paced and um, it's like an hour and 20 minutes so it's basically like a a movie and i think that's the length of all these episodes and 
I think they did that for one episode of the previous season, but it just felt like such a fucking drag. And also, um, what's his face? Fucking um, Falcon, the main Anthony Mackie. Anthony Mackie is like the main person in this, and it was just weird. I, I wasn't the biggest fan at all. In fact, I kind of zoned out at some point and was like, "Is this going to hurry up and hurry up and finish?" Because I'm I'm bored. <laughs> All right. Uh, I saw that you watched season two of Happy. Uh, did did it need a second season? Uh, it, it didn't need a second season, but it got one. And if you enjoyed the first, <laughs> no, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it, it got one. And uh, it wasn't quite as good as the first one. But if you liked the first season, you would like the second, of which I would. And honestly, I feel like a lot of people are possibly sleepy on this show because I just think it's so, it's so fucking weird. But it's so fun to watch. Uh, obviously, I, I talked about the first season, but if you're only joining us now, Happy is a weird show in which a guy uh, in the first season nearly dies, and then he wakes up and he can see he uh, he can see this imaginary friend, this unicorn, and then that's it leads him down a merry full show full of fucking child molesters. Uh, dressed in Santa Claus and weird cults and all sorts of wacky shit. It is really like no other show you can watch, really, is the way to put it. It is one of the weirdest fucking things you can watch, and it's 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 quite fun. And the second season was fun, too. Uh, they set it up for a third one, so... Uh, but I don't know if we're going to get it. I think it's, like, in limbo at the moment, so we'll see. Cool. Uh, and then I saw that you watched the last of the... Marvel TV series coming to Netflix, uh, Jessica Jones season three. Yes, uh, Jessica Jones was weird because it's uh, it's the last season of Jessica Jones, but you're as you also watch it, you know that you're watching the last of the Marvel TV Netflix like universe, I guess. So it's like this finale for everything, yet it doesn't really be a finale for anything. Uh, the final episode of this is very, it's not happy at all. It's not very uplifting. Uh, lots of stuff. It really just feels like, Hey, where's season four? Because there's lots of stuff I want to see finished up here. Uh, and then also they hinted some other stuff that could have been happening with other characters within the Netflix Marvel universe. So as like a finisher for the thing, it's, it's quite odd. Uh, but as a series, I really enjoyed it. I know a lot of people had problems with the second season. I honestly feel like if you didn't like the second season, you won't like this one because a lot of people were always watching a Jessica Jones, trying to compare it to the first season and the great villain that was Kilgrave. They were never really going to be able to do Kilgrave again or do a villain like Kilgrave. So, um, and they definitely don't try to in the third season. In fact, I would argue that what a lot of people and what you may think is actually the the main villain of the third season isn't actually supposed to be the main villain. It's just someone there set up to uh, invoke drama between uh, Jessica and her sister, who are the main the third season basically resolves revolves around the plot of Jessica and her sister and what they're going through following the events of the second season. Um, so it's more family trouble and these sorts of things, I guess. Uh, and I, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I think I, I love everyone in the show, the actors, uh, the writing. Um, definitely, it was still say is my favorite Marvel series. It's the only Marvel Netflix series that I watched every season of. So sad to see it go, but there we go. Mm. Cool. Uh, with it now, sort of the whole that the whole universe wrapped up. Do you feel like it's worth? someone new to go back and look through it or what how would you rank them i don't know off the top of my head it was just i don't know i feel like you could watch the first season of daredevil and the first season of jessica jones and then just probably stop there to be honest <laughs> uh, I, I reckon the second season of daredevil is worth watching too well, oh, uh, yeah. Th- here's my problem. I only, I only like it with the Punisher. And soon as that, that's the first what six episodes. Watch the first um, half of season two. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then it gets to be a whole bunch of shit about nin- ninjas and shit, yeah, which is the, the, fucking the terrible. Foot, the hand or the foot or whatever they are. The hand. Yeah. Just- <laughs> the hand. The foot is yeah. Ninja Turtles. The elbows. Yeah. I, yeah. 
I so that's why I was like, if you if you was only watched like a couple, it would just Jessica Jones season one is really good by itself. The Kilgrave storyline, Kilgrave is probably one of Marvel's even including the movies, it would still be top three villains for me, Kilgrave. Uh, and then also season one of Daredevil is really really good because it's uh what's his what's that uh, Vince Vincent D'Onofrio, D'Onofrio, yeah yeah like kind of at his finest in that role I think I much enjoyed him there than his appearances in future seasons because it was more him in the civilian role still trying to like like he's he's trying not to get away and he's he's not known as a villain yet so um and then on future seasons whenever you see him it's like everyone knows he's the villain so it wasn't as exciting uh but I mean you can basically skip all of the defenders stuff you could uh, even like uh Iron not Iron Fist is shit. Uh, what's his fuck? Uh, what's the what's Luke the Cage guy's name? Nick? No, not is it? What? Luke, what's his name? Luke Cage. Luke Cage. Yeah, Luke, Luke Cage season one. Uh, I like, but once again, I feel like the first six episodes is the strongest, and then they similar to Daredevil season two. The last half isn't as good. So yeah, I mean, the more I think about it, Jessica Jones season one, Daredevil season one. That's all you need to. Watch. I reckon Punisher season one was pretty good too. I thought you'd say that. Yeah, shocking. <laughs> Uh, and then I also have seen you've watched almost all of Dark season one. I've, I've finished the first season now. Finished it, okay. Yeah, so I finished the first season. Um, this show came out, I think December twenty seventeen or something like that. <clears throat> and then the second season released a couple weeks ago, which is what and that kind of was being promoted and that made me go oh yeah fuck i wanted to watch that like a year and a half ago or whatever it was when it the first season released it it, it was the first uh netflix international show or whatever it was like it's a netflix german uh production and it is really fucking good and it's one of those shows where i'm watching and i'm like fuck why didn't i watch this back in the day <laughs> like why have i missed on it for so long but the premise is basically this uh and without going into heavy spoilers, I'm not going to go too far, obviously, but this kid goes missing in 2019. And the, so you've got this whole family drama stuff happening of like the family dealing with their, their like 12, 13 year old son, whatever it is, missing and the brother and the sister. So you've got that family drama element and it's in a small town in Germany and you've got like other members dealing with it and the police trying to find out who it is and all these sorts of things. And then without kind of explaining how it all works, because for obvious spoilers, time travel gets chucked in. They just chuck a time travel spanner at you. So the show is very heavy into sci-fi. Um, and once they introduce it, each episode, they kind of just keep it playing with it more, playing with it more. And as season one progresses and you see how everything kind of gets explained and how things fit into place that you saw in the first episode and how it all starts to make sense. It was really smart. I was like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. And then like you'll do those things where something's getting revealed in your head. You're like, Oh, so that means that, which means that. And then I saw that thing in season three, which probably means that you start like linking all these things up together, which is uh, really cool to see. It's really well acted. It's shot really well. It does a thing that I feel like could turn off people, but I quite enjoy it is like nearly a second, every second episode, it feels like they do like a five minute montage to a song showing you like what all the characters are up to and stuff like that. But like life I don't mind that. Hey, like life is strange. Yeah. Yeah. Basically it does that like every second episode and, um, but the song choices are good. And it kind of just shows you where it's meant to show you where every character is at emotionally. Cause it's basically at the end of the episode as well. So it's like, here's where everyone is at now. Um, and I like it. Uh, and I'm really pumped to start second season because it's, it, the first season ends on this massive cliffhanger and you're like, what does this mean? This is fucking crazy. But yeah, I, if the, if the second season is good as the first season, which from everything I've read and I, uh, seen online, people are saying it's better than the first season then I could definitely see Dark Season 2 being on, like, my short list for, like, top five TV shows for myself for this year, if it, if, if it holds up. It's really, really good. Uh, I suppose it's worth mentioning, if you're interested, yes, this show is subtitled, although, if you're like me, your Netflix will fuck you, and I'll start the show in um, dubbed, 
and it'll make me want to throw my remote at the screen because I started the show and then straight away this woman started talking to this guy and like the mouth was the lip syncing was it was like hello how are you you know like all our thing and I was like what the fuck is going on <laughs> I thought this was a German show what is going on here so I had to pause it and go, like go into subtitles and uh, turn them off and I was like why would you automatically choose the dub option I'm like that is rid- ridiculous um, but yeah dark really really good awesome. All right, so we can move into some news now. And uh, Scarlett Johansson's really put her foot in it this week, <laughs> um, to put it lightly. Uh, she was doing a uh, cover story for As If magazine, and she is quoted as saying, You know, as an actor, I should be able to play any person or any tree or any animal because that's my job and the requirements of my job. Uh she also said, goes on to say, I feel like political correctness is a trend in my business and it needs to be, happen for various social reasons, yet there are times it does get uncomfortable when it affects the art because I feel art should not be re- fr- should be free of restrictions. I think society would be more connected if we were just allow others to have their own feelings and not expect everyone to feel the same way that they do. Uh, to put it lightly, she was roasted <laughs> on Twitter and other places. Uh, I I think she's right to a degree. Uh yeah, to a certain extent. Obviously this is on the back of her earlier in the year um no. Last end of last year she was going to be doing a movie called Robin Tug in which she was going to be playing a trans man character um and had to pull out. Basically she was pressured into not doing the role after a bunch of transgender performers came out and uh said that she shouldn't do the role or they were passed over as also on the back of it also doing uh ghost in the shell a couple of years ago which was an adaptation of a japanese anime and of course we all know scarlett johansson is not japanese um dylan do you have some (laughs) thoughts on this uh uh i saw jimmy wong did a really good tweet which i just found on my phone that i thought uh jimmy wong is going to be an upcoming mulan so there's my tone for if you don't know who he is. Uh, so as an actor who thought the exact same thing as ScarJo, I sat for years on the side. By the way, for context, he's uh, Asian descent. Oh, sorry, like that's where the, the thing comes in. Uh, as an actor who thought the exact same as ScarJo, I sat for years on the sideline <coughs> applying for everything but never really called into an audition unless the role specifically said Asian. It all boils down to this. Just because you can sh- doesn't necessarily mean you should. Um, and throughout the rest of Fred, he basically talks to people about the fact of uh, he understands what she's saying. And, to, and he's like, in a perfect world, what she's saying would be true. Uh, if the playing field for everyone was the same, what she w- what she's saying would be true and would hold ground. But the playing field is not the same for everyone. So what she's doing is not okay because uh that that's just the way the world is and if the people who are more likely to get the roles like she is in her uh her place and her position within the industry if she's not willing to accept that she shouldn't be taking the roles designed for uh minorities or you know the, the asian roles the fucking the roles for transgender people whatever whatever you if you want to chuck in there if if, if she's taking all the roles or any actors taking any sorts of roles from the, these sorts of people then how the fuck do those people get roles is the, the thing so and i've seen other people of actors and stuff tweet some of the things even um what's the fuck from the good place uh what's her name the posh british no, actress pers- something i can't remember so what yes i think yeah not yeah not she Kristen was tweet uh not Christian Bell, the, the other main actress. Uh, she was tweeting similar things. I've seen most people say similar things, which is like, well, a lot of people are just being like, scarch your hands and shut the fuck up. But the more nuanced thoughts I've seen have said, especially from actresses and actors in the industry, have had a similar thing where it's like, that would be nice if that's how it worked, where you, as an actor, you could just do what you wanted and pick the roles and blah, 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 blah. But that only works in a world where we all are on the same field and we can all get the roles, but that is not how it works. So that is not an okay thing to say, which is basically where I'd agree upon it because 
like f- think for something for the like the transgender role, for example. There are how many fucking how many movies do you think are going to be about a uh, transgender person a, a year, if if anything, a year, one, maybe, two, maybe, and you're going to give the role to someone who's you've got you've got a, a small handful of actual transgender actors out there you're not gonna give it to them you got a small selection of well no, not even small you got a fucking very wide selection of talented uh asian actors and actresses i guess out there and you want to give it to a white person how the fuck do they get roles as the white person they're never going to win over the white person <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever going to cast the, the as someone over the white person. It's not going to how it's, it's not how it's going to work. So, uh, yeah, I think she's very dumb comment, very naive comment that comes from a place of privilege. I, I will say that uh, she's come out with a statement saying that the her comments were edited for clickbait and were widely taken out of context. Uh, she's quoted in a statement released later. The question I was answering in my conversation with the contemporary artist David Sale was that about the confrontation between being. Between political correctness and art, I personally feel that in an ideal world, any actor should be able to play anybody and art in all forms should be immune to a political correctness. That is the point I was making, albeit it didn't come across that way. I recognize in reality there is a widespread dispre- discrepancy amongst my industry that favors Caucasian cisgendered actors and that not, not every actor has been given the same opportunities that I've been privileged to. I continue to support and always have diversity in every industry and will continue to fight for projects where everyone is included. Whether she means that uh, or that's just a backpedaling, backpedaling. Yeah, uh, but I mean the first part of that's exactly what is exactly right. It's like if it wasn't even in a perfect food, world. It yes, uh, in a perfect world. Of course, we don't live in a perfect world. I think to a certain extent, it's it's hard for someone to turn down work. It's like it's not on her to turn down the job. It's on the producers to offer the roles to people they should be offering the roles to. Yeah. No, well, this is where I fall. Like, if you, this, and this isn't just, this, this is my opinion on just like actors or anything. This is just my, my opinion in life in general. So you could be a fucking rich, a rich banker person out there or whatever it is. If you're in a, a place of privilege, uh, you have power, you, you, you have it. And it, to, to kind of sit back and be like, oh, it's not on me to make change. That's your choice, I guess. I don't think it's the right choice. Like, shouldn't should an actor or actress say no to roles and be aware of stuff that uh, that they're taking potentially minority roles as an actor or an actress i 100 percent believe they should be aware of that stuff and they can either choose to give two fucks or give zero fucks and if they choose to give zero fucks and take the roles then and take the money that's your choice i guess like that that's your right that's your, your freedom of choice as a person, but also people should be allowed to be like, well, that's kind of fucked up, like like they did for Ghost in the Shell, so, and whatever else continues to happen. Nick, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I don't think they should cast Scarlett Johansson in anything, because she's not very good. <laughs> harsh. Super harsh. Solves all the problems. <laughs> I mean, the other thing I would argue is... Is Scarlett Johansson's pulling power? She's, uh, I think she is the big, most highest drawing actress in Hollywood at the moment. Obviously, she's Should involved in a lot there. of Marvel movies, so that inflates her numbers a little bit. Uh, but do you think a movie like Robin Tug gets made without Scarlett Johansson? Is Scarlett um, Johansson's involvement going to get it seen by a wider audience and have that story told to a wider audience? Or is it now just going to be a film that happens to show up at a film festival and maybe it'll show up on Netflix or Amazon Prime. Uh, well, it'll be dropped there, dumped there, never to be seen by the wider public. This this exact line of thinking is what leads to, uh, I can't remember the fucking movie or the actor's name, but it's that real famous movie where someone does the most racist uh, Asian role, that real famous actor. Fuck, what the, is that movie? It's only from like the 70s or 80s or whatever it is. They put on the full like... My stereotypical accent, real famous role. Why'd they cast that person? Because it was a famous actor. Because it was the seventies. Also, because it was a famous actor at the time. It wasn't. It was. It was like late seventies, eighties. There was. You could have got anyone else. Uh, I mean, this this argument has been around for ages. This this is the thing. Everyone likes to act like 
this is some argue, this is a new thing that's come out in the last couple of years. Even when fucking Jared Leto did um Dallas Dallas Buyers Club, and I thought that movie was perfectly fine, and I thought he gave a really great performance. Blah 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 blah. But all those things aside, even when that movie was coming out, people were like, "Why is Jared Leto playing the the character?" And I was like, "Interesting argument." Sure. So these arguments are always happening. So, and, and I remember when that one was happening, the exact thing was happening then. Well, if they didn't have Jared Leto in it, would it get as much draw? Because he's a big famous movie um, musician. You know, everyone loves fucking 30 Seconds to Mars. People are going to see it because of him. Blah, 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 blah. There's always going to be some defense. You know? There's always going to be some defense. Well, you have to put the, the, the biggest star in the movie to get the people to see the movie. Blah, 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 blah. But then at that stage, don't we just put the fucking rock in every movie? Yeah, that's a fair... You just cast the rock in everything? I mean, he can only do so many things. The rock and... Who's next biggest movie star these days? <laughs> I don't know. Whoever then. We only cast real famous people to try and sell movies? Well, if they fit the fit what they're going for, I guess. Um, yeah. I guess it's interesting also to have this comment come out a week after... It was announced that uh, Halle Bailey, uh, a young black woman, will be playing The Little Mermaid in Disney's remake of The Little Mermaid. Uh, everybody, it, that was also very divisive <laughs> news. Uh, were you guys surprised by how divisive it was? To be honest, I haven't heard anything about it. <laughs> of course you didn't. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's the bliss of not being on social media. Oh, I, I don't get involved in all this shit. Here's the thing of that casting. Every time this, every time one of these arguments come up, the the fuck boys on Twitter or whatever, they're going, "Well, can't you just cast the best person for the role and stop pandering to SJW nonsense?" You know, some variation of that is what they say. So for the Little Mermaid, they go out and apparently interview uh, whatever, like one thousand five hundred fucking people. They audition like one thousand five hundred people for the role, and they happen to pick her. And then they go, well, you're pandering. And they're like, we auditioned 1,500 various people. And we picked the one that we thought was best for the role. And now we're pandering. <laughs> we're doing literally what you want us to do. <laughs> and you're still yelling about it. I couldn't get it. I'm like, there's, there's literally no pe- pleasing these people. Also, a mermaid is a fictional fucking creature. And people are like, well, it has to be white. Does it though? does it no it doesn't it could be fucking i don't care it could be a any it's a fucking mermaid who cares i, I give zero fucks and also everyone's like what's well, not my little mermaid they're making it you know who they're making a the little mermaid for fucking eight ten year old little girls that are going to go see this movie and be like this is great now this is my little mermaid you got some little f- f- fucking 40 year old man at home who's like i can no longer jerk off to this version of the little mermaid because she's no longer white fuck out of here you fucking pervert there's my feelings on it. I don't know why you automatically went to jacking off, but okay. These fucking people do It's the same thing as, uh, what's that Netflix, the cartoon that came out, uh, they've done two seasons now, you watched it, uh, not He-Man, She-Woman or whatever. She-Ra. 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 People are complaining, she doesn't look womanly enough now. She, they got rid of her tits and stuff. I'm like, why are you complaining about the tits on this animated character unless you're wanting to jerk off to it? Unless you're wanting to jerk off to it. Full stop. Fuck boys. Get the yep. fuck out of here. You're okay. all a bunch of grown men, pervert motherfuckers and I hate years old. And I hope you all crash in a car and die. Talking about more news involving black women that angered people. Uh, it came out today that uh, uh, Lashana Lynch from uh, Captain Marvel will be playing 007 in the latest James Bond film. Well, hold on. Just to clarify, this I don't think this wasn't confirmed. Confirmed. It it's not confirmed, confirmed. Confirmed, but it's it it's pretty uh, it's pretty being reported everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they even described this. I think interestingly, they did, the place that it came from described the scene where it's revealed as popcorn dropping. Ooh. Yes. Tantalizing. Yes. Yeah, so no, James Bond is not turning into a black woman. There, it will be black. Uh, the story is James Bond has retired and now somebody else is coming in and filling his role as 007, played by uh, Lashana Lynch, Lashana Lynch from Captain Marvel. Um, 
Is it? In- it's been interesting seeing the people get upset about this one. Yeah, it's surprising that people were upset about a thing on the internet today. I'm shocked. To be fair, a lot of the headlines were pretty clickbaity. So, and yeah, people should learn to fucking read articles or something. They don't want they, that. Then they'll get the click. That's oh, how 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 dare they? Here, here's my here's my thing with this. Here's my two cents. Right, I I the last James Bond movie was terrible. Yep. Uh, James Bond's sales, money wise, uh, aren't as good as people want to believe. It's not actually a a beloved worldwide franchise anymore. Uh, the, if you look at the last couple entries, they're up down up down. So quality wise, it's not exactly holding. So if they're looking to change up the franchise somewhat and bring in different talent, uh, in a world where that's happening, yeah. Uh, I, I would want to be doing that too, considering it looks like James Bond, the franchise, could be headed towards its grave as it's going at the moment. But also, on top of all this, if you read the story, as far as I'm concerned, it never actually says that she will be taking over the role for future movies. It just says, it is. It, it, to me, it just sounds like a plot point that is going to be in the movie. James Bond is retired. James Bond gets asked to come out of retirement for whatever reason thing that happens in the movie he returns to mi6 m's there she's like hey 007 out comes the other the new person who's taken over the 007 mantra because in case you idiots don't understand 007 is literally just a code name that if he retires they would give to a different agent that is how it works there was a 007 probably before james bond didn't if you want to go oh, maybe if he's the first one it makes sense there's other double o agents doesn't matter so it's just a fucking code name so if you've got uh, what's her name again? I've, I've made a blank on it. Uh, Lashia Lynch. Lashana Lynch. If she's playing 007 in this movie, it just means she's playing 007 in this movie. She's not playing James Bond. She's playing a different character who's got the code name is 007. And to me, it just sounds like that's going to be a plot point in the movie of Bond having to deal with the, the fact that someone else is... That he's been his... replaced by a young black woman. Yeah. <laughs> Which you, you could also, I guess... Would, read <laughs> into. In directions... <laughs> Uh, read into go in different directions with but yeah so everyone on the internet's flipping out saying that they've like ne- this is the new james bond and all this sort of stuff and i'm like i uh, i mean they could do that and i personally would be fine with that if she's good on screen because i give zero fucks if james bond retires and they continue the franchise with a different character although at that point it's no longer the james bond franchise it's just the double it would be a spin-off 007 thing which sure i really give zero fucks um but yeah everything that they revealed in the article none of it says that they're suddenly changing the character and having her spin off and be like having her replace the 007 thing it just seems like a movie plot point and everyone's flipping their fucking lid yeah i'm gonna bet a bit take a bet with anybody that she will die by the end of that film and james Bond will be 007 again yeah, I, I honestly, if, if they turned her into the lead of this franchise, I would be like, who the fuck at MGM grew some massive Wow, bowls? those producers, man, they, <laughs> they've been smoking some pot. <laughs> man. Well, because that would be wow, such a brave Why move. didn't Danny Boyle want to stay on? <laughs> well, you know who's involved with the script on this one? Yeah, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is yes. punching up the script, so. Yeah, so. I mean, they're shooting at the so, moment, so. It must be pretty much done, I would assume. No, because they had to take like weeks off because Daniel Craig oh, fucking right, stubbed his did. toe the first day. <laughs> Maybe that's why they're bringing her in. He did a Harrison Ford. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, does this get you enticed to see the next James Bond film, Nick? I was going to see it regardless. My only concern is I didn't think she was particularly good in Captain Marvel, but that's the only thing I've seen her in, so I don't know the quality of her yeah, acting. Yeah, I don't know much of her work outside of Captain Marvel. Um, yeah. The other bit of news is apparently Christoph Waltz might be coming back as Cleveland yeah, Blomfield, whoever he's called, from Spectre. Yeah, Boo. Is that there. also that's not a spoiler nowadays? I suppose to say that he actually played Blofeld because remember that was a that was keeping it hush hush for the whole promotional period. Be like, he's not Blofeld. I mean, and do, everyone was can like, can you spoil bad Blofeld. movies? No, but that was a weird <laughs> thing about that promotion. It's like every time you watch a trailer, you'd be like, "He's Blowfield." No, but no, it's a new character for the film. It's new. It's new. It's a new character. And then by the end of that movie, it's like it's Blowfield. And you're like, "Yeah." The, I mean, I, we didn't to see be honest, that I completely forgot he was in James Bond until we just talked about it. Then, yeah, because that movie's trash. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, is. <laughs> super forgettable. Yeah. Uh, so 
uh, interesting, I guess, story. Um, came out this past week. Uh, involving Big Little Lies Season 2. So, obviously, Big Little Lies came out last year. Huge success. Mm, what was the year before? Was it two years ago now? Didn't they take it? Because uh, they had a year off because Sharp Objects came out last year. Yeah, so it must have been 2017. Sh- Huge yeah. success. Uh, directed by John Mark Valley, uh, with starring Reese Witherspoon, Laura Linney. Laura Lin- no, Kidman. Laura Dern. Uh, Nicole Kidman. A bunch of other people. Uh, of course... Uh, director, uh, John Mark Valley then went on to do Sharp Objects last year, uh, turned down doing a second season. So they went and got Andrea Arnold, who had previously directed, uh, American Honey, which starred Shia LaBeouf, uh, which was reasonably well regarded, let her direct the entire season. Uh, but it has come out that the John Mark Valley has come back and recut and I guess reshot some stuff in his vision, uh, which would be fine. That's he's an executive producer. I guess they're allowed to do that or whatever. But apparently, uh, Andrea Arnold was not informed at all about this happening. Um, I think this is the most bizarre story I've seen in Hollywood for a little while. Uh, for someone to come back and completely <laughs> change a season of television. Uh, Dylan, you're a massive, you're a huge fan of Big Little Lies season one. I think it was like in your top five of that year. It was my number one show of the year. Number yeah. one, even better. Um, mm. Have you been watching season two? Or No, because I've been scared of season two because I, I liked the way season one ended and I'm like, that's all that, that there needed to be. And then as soon as they announced I was doing a second season, I was like, mm, I don't know how I feel about it. And I've just kind of been waiting for it to um, wrap so I can I can binge it. Although reading stuff like this makes me go, mm. But at the same time, I've seen nothing but positive reception for the second season, which is of a really weird thing. So yeah, you have weeks and weeks of people saying the show is really good or like maybe it's not quite as good as the first season, but either way, it's like still quality um, television. But then you have like the, the weirdest story coming out where it sounds like it's this hodgepodge put together mess really. Skim the article yeah. it sounds like similar to what happened to American Gods. Uh just behind really, the scenes drama. Well it's what well, it's not even drama is the thing because that show had proper drama. So what happened here basically is um uh what's her name sorry for, um and, like honey Andrea Arnold. Andrea Arnold so she gets hired to drag the second season because uh what's his face is going off John to Mark do- Valley John Mark Valley, yeah, here we go. Uh, he's going. Sorry, I just saw him. Please, uh, John Mark Valley goes off to do Sharp Objects. He had signed on to do that already. So, and they wanted to rush HBO. They HBO wanted to rush a second season because uh, Big Little Lies picked up lots of Golden Globes and won like nearly all of them that it was nominated for. Before An amazing the cast. show, blah blah. And yeah, so they they wanted to rush out a second season to I guess capitalize. Use the, cash in on it I, I guess is what you'd say somewhat um so yeah they, they hire this other director and throughout the entire shooting period it was apparently fine everyone loved her as the director the cast was all happy with it they finished shooting the season everyone thinks yay this is really good they gave her full reign to shoot it however they however she wanted blah blah blah, blah. so i think everyone was like yeah this is great we're gonna have a really interesting second season it's gonna be a little bit different to the first because we've got a different director involved but whatever and then after it's all done, uh, Sean McVally comes back in after he's finished up Sharp Objects and gets to work editing it. And then suddenly he's like, okay, we need to do like all this reshoots. I've got my whole editing team on it, blah, 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 blah. And we're basically re-editing and reshooting footage. So it looks more like I shot this instead of this other director uh, who had no involvement, but apparently if in the article says had to be on set. Yeah. While DGA of, rules uh, required Arnold to be the director on set, Valley was now an extremely hands-on EP, dictating not only what would be shot, but how it would be shot, uh, oversight that Arnold never had during the initial shoot. Crazy. Yeah, so she ba- basically had to sit there and be like, I'm here, I'm getting paid, but... Like, I'm not allowed to have just, any creative just, input. Yeah, I'm just being put to the corner. So Sounds like yeah, a dick move. Yeah, to, to say the least. It's really... 
quite odd, I guess. And it's it's even odder if all this works out and it still turns out <laughs> to be such a really good season at the same time. It's like, well, what do we say now apart from it being really weird? I guess like wh- when you boil it down, it's, it's like the whole image of this independent theme, uh, filmmaker uh, being brought in to do this and then having to sit there after putting in all this hard work and hours and whatever else, and then her final days on it, uh, having to sit in the corner while the fucking dude turns back up about six months late to the shoot, and it's like, yeah, I got it now. I'll finish it. Shut up. Even though I didn't like, want to. Yeah. Like, it kind of just paints, a obviously, a bad image. And I honestly, I, I'm interested if anyone else like Reese Witherspoon, Nicole Kidman, anyone else ever speaks out and how they feel about it because I mean their EPs on the show they're they were speaking quite positively for at the time like some of them I follow on Instagram and like I every time I while I was shooting I saw them posting and I'd be like so happy with the shooting process so now I'm wondering like how they feel about it after what's happened post and whatever else is going on. So, yeah, it's it's just really odd story, if anything. Really <laughs> odd. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, it goes without saying. It'd be interesting if it's just because she's a woman that they felt that they could do this. Or whether they did actually plan from the beginning for him to take over and do whatever he wanted. Well, that's the other thing. Like, if, if you want to get, hire someone to shoot in a certain style and tell them up front, Hey, he's busy doing this other show. You're basically going to be a ghost director. And we yeah, need give to him shoot a style guide ways. or something. It's just like you could hire someone to do that and you would get someone on board with that. But to hire someone who's not a, that kind of director to literally hire like an independent filmmaker who has a like flourishing style and then to waste it all seems Odd. It doesn't seem like that was planned from the start at all. Because if it was, why would you do that? Why would you hire someone who's not going to paint a, a, a very easy picture that you could fill in later? It's odd. Cool. All right. Speaking of HBO, uh, <laughs> we finally got more information about the new Warner Media f- streaming service that will be coming out in 2020. It will be called HBO Max. Yeah. Uh, at, at least it is not HBO Plus, which I don't know plus plus. if I'm happy or sad about. Um, it, it's going to have a w- wide amount of content. Obviously, they're going to have a lot of HBO content, uh, but they also have claims all 236 episodes of Friends, which we all know earlier in the year, Netflix spent, I want to say $10 million purchasing the rights for, for another year. So that- Hashtag worth it. <laughs> hashtag worth it i guess um so that'll be a massive boon for them uh they'll also have all the exclusive streaming rights for fresh prince of bel-air and pretty little liars all future cw produced dramas will be exclusive to the service uh starting with this year's offerings of uh batwoman and kathy Keene. is uh, this cw owned by warner anyway warner yep so all the all the streaming services post it being released on cw will come to uh, exclusively to that. Um, and also Greg Blanty and Reese Witherspoon have both got deals uh, to produce uh, films for the service. Uh, the service says is said to bring together programs from HBO, Warner Brothers, Dude Line, DC Entertainment, CNN, TBT, TNT, TBS, True TV, The C- CW, Turner Classic Movies, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, Crunchyroll, Rooster Teeth, The, the Looney Tunes, and more. Uh, and will feature a bunch of original content. Uh, including a Gremlins prequel animated series, um, and a bunch of other uh, the Dune, the Dune <laughs> uh, TV series that will uh, be called Dune: The Sisterhood, that has uh, Dennis Villeneuve involved. Uh, and yes, it's expected to come out in twenty twenty. Uh, how do you guys feel about the news? The name, the copy the and paste. Every other conversation we've had about streaming networks and pasted here. <laughs> um, yeah. I doubt it'll come to Australia, especially with all the HBO content. Yeah, not initially. Fox, yeah. I, I think Foxtel will still pay 
massive amounts of money to have that well, then locked in. They could still come here. It just would be exclusive to. But then there's no reason for me to get it, to be honest. Okay. Yeah, they. You need the Foxtel deal to 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 go away, um, for this to be worth it in Australia, or to even come in to come to Australia. Really? I think. You would prefer to pay however much you have to pay for Foxtel rather than whatever you. No, I would not pay. prefer no, to no, pay no, no, it. No, no. But I'm, Foxtel I'm saying- is gonna fucking lock those in for ninety nine years or something. You, they'll just fucking pay out their ass to keep that. I don't know. Foxtel, how, 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 let, Foxtel have been running at a loss the last year, so I don't know how much money they've got to throw around. Uh, River Murdoch has just signed a couple billion dollar deal with Disney. So, the so he has Murdoch, a couple of billion Foxtel. dollars to throw around. So expect the Mandalorian to be shown on Foxtel two years after it's already aired on Disney Plus. Um, yeah, the, the, the Foxtel thing is like the biggest hang-up for any of this sort of shit. You need Foxtel to go away, but then it's like... Uh, it's so funny because it, it'd be a perfect world. For Foxtel and HBO break up. We get this HBO streaming service that I'd rather pay for, but then without HBO, Foxtel will basically lose all its subscribers and die, which is perfectly fine by me, but that's <laughs> that's like the, the, the reason it won't true. happen. I think no, it, the amount of people from, that buy for this sport alone is ridiculous. I was going to say, it, yeah. like, sport would still exist, but I it, it would, the prices would drop drastically for them to just attack a sports user base at that point, I think. Like, if they didn't have the HBO stuff, I think. I don't know. So, the HBO stuff is, what, a couple of series a year? No, it's way more than that. Like, there's heaps of HBO series that happen. Maybe. Like, you know, Game, of, Game of Thrones, bring Watchmen, in Big the Little numbers Lies, Europa, you'd need. whatever it's called. Euphoria. The one with all the penises. Euphoria. Um, but, yeah, other than Game of Thrones, what do they have currently that would draw in a huge crowd, number of new subscribers? Uh, well, on HBO. On HBO. Uh, Watchmen when it comes, I guess. That's true. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, if Warner Brothers is going to produce it, uh, uh, release it, I guess this is as good as they could come up with. Uh, it's interesting. I think there is now, this will be the third HBO streaming service available. Um, so maybe they'll be streaming like that, that in the future. Uh, also, word is that they're not going to be doing anything with the DC streaming service. Like, they're not going to change anything. Even though that the DC Doom Patrol was featured in the ad. Um, so, it might just be that their content will be across both HBO Max I, and I think that makes DC. sense because, like, if you have different price points, yeah. the DC one will work better for people who just want the DC stuff. Plus, you got the, plus comic the comics side of that thing. So maybe it works out better. So yeah, I, I don't feel like the DC thing needs to go away for this to work. It just it's like what package works best for what you want, kind of thing. Yeah. So again, it'll be interesting to see because we are definitely reaching the tipping point of streaming services. Uh, arguably, Disney Plus is the last necessity that we all need, um, and it'll be interesting to see how long some of the smaller streaming services can survive when Warner Brothers is hoarding all their content. Disney is the only one that's going to put a thumb on Netflix. So, I like, guess. they're going to come out for well. If Warner Brothers pulls all their con from net content from Netflix, and then Disney pulls all their content from Netflix, there's only only a few other production companies that yeah, they but can get like, content from. Most of the time, stuff I'm watching on Netflix is Netflix original stuff anyway. So none of that really bothers me because I I. I I'm happy to pay for Netflix original programs if their original programs are good and I watch them, which I watch a majority of their original stuff, even their like stand ups and their documentaries and whatever else. Like they've got a variety of original content these days. So um, I think they, they were smart when they switched to wanting to spend more money on original stuff rather than buying up stuff, which is a decision they made a couple of years ago. That was kind of future proofing, I guess, a bit more there. Um, even though these days they're like, uh, Triple Frontier didn't make much money and we spent way too much money on it. So now <laughs> we got to like be smarter about what we're going to spend our money on. And our first move with being smarter with our money is to say we're going to make a movie of The Rock and some and whoever else. <laughs> some big thing. I'm like, that's not being smart with money. But yeah, um, yeah it, like Disney and Netflix, I feel like would just, they'll be the top two. Um, 
I could see the rest of the rest of the ones who are fighting though. It's, it, Netflix and Disney are fine. They're they're going to survive. They're just the ones. Yeah. Uh, also interesting, they include Rooster Teeth and Crunchyroll. I guess within the service, what kind of content are we going to get from Rooster Teeth? Is it just going to be? It'll just be the. You know, will be the, will it be Rooster Teeth first as part of the package? No. I don't reckon it'll be first because that's like access to heaps of stuff, including like random fucking funhouse projects and whatever else. It'll just be their uh, their documentaries and their anime properties and whatever else. It won't be like all the Rooster Teeth first content. It'll just be the their their, their shows, their their movies, whatever. Yeah, I guess with Crunchyroll, it could just be a rotating number of anime going through the service. I guess, or you just keep could the, be. I guess. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Still at least six months away so wh- thing to keep an eye on but again friends it's going to be a huge draw for a lot of americans apparently but at this point you could just buy the whole series on like apple itunes store or google play who the fucking america cares about friends hasn't already watched it already i don't like, who's it, buying it's it like just comfort to keep food, on I guess. rewatching friends yeah people finish it and then they'll just start it again it's not even that good yeah it's true. fine <laughs> it's fine it's nost- like, i have watched it all so i can't say it's bad because i've watched it all so <laughs> but do you need to watch the same 236 episodes consistently N- no but because there's, there's so many episodes <laughs> yeah that's that's how i feel but like a lot of people who don't watch a lot of new stuff they they get a comfort thing like friends and they will watch one episode in the morning or night with tea or whatever or breakfast wh- whatever you need to be um, in the background, because I've seen it before, they'll finish the show and then they will literally just start it again. People do that for Friends, for Seinfeld, for like all these big 10, 11, 12 season things, I guess. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, final story I want to just touch on. It was announced that we are going to be getting a Akira sequels anime series. Uh, just in time for the 20th, 2020 Tokyo Olympics Akira creator and director Katsuro Otoma has confirmed that he will be helming a new animated series continuing the story of the groundbreaking cyberpunk classic. Uh, He revealed the sequel series at a panel at the Anime Expo in Los Angeles, where he unveiled the series will be produced by Bandai Namco's Sunrise. Uh, No word whether it will be a new story for this sequel series or they'll be adapting the manga. Uh, Of course, the original... The original manga ran from 1982 to 1990 and told the story of a post-apocalyptic Neo-Tokyo uh, that had been destroyed and rebuilt after a mysterious explosion. He would relay to adapt the first part of the series into the animated film Akira. Um, of course, we've still got the Taika Waititi film coming out. Still being worked on. It's been in development hell for like decades. Um, and there is also going to be a 4K remaster of the original 1988 film. See, that's the most exciting thing because it means I can buy this movie for the fourth time. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as someone who's bought the film three times, how do you feel about this news? Is this, is this something you're keen for? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm keen. I'm going to watch it. I, 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 because they didn't say much, I'm not, I'm not like, well, this is super exciting. I'm like, cool. Can't wait to read a tr- read more or like get a trailer or actually know what the fuck that we're, we're doing with this or how it's going to look because if the animation style is completely different, it's really going to, piss me off and put me off because i love the animation style of the original and if they try and update it or do something different i'm that's probably going to be my drawing point and be like no i'm really against this now so uh but i yeah i I love the i love the movie it's i'd say it's probably my i mean no it's my favorite anime movie for sure um but really it's always hard yeah it's always hard for me to put it i'm pretty sure you've said um the miyazaki film was in your top five? <sighs> yeah, uh, Spirited Away. Yeah, love Spirited Away. I don't know. That's different. Different strokes, but yeah, they're both great. But I mean, I literally have. You can't say I literally have the fucking the, the vinyl like uh, on my up here in the thing. You can't really see it, I don't think. But um, I love this the soundtrack for the movie. I love the art. I love the I love the story. Uh, it's real. It's themes. I love how it's it's a proper like cyberpunk thing. 
Yeah. A lot of people probably won't describe it as like a cyberpunk movie, but I feel like it's kind of early. Uh, people describe it as like what uh, Neo Tokyo, I, I guess, is the way that you'd go for it. Um, but one, once it gets it, the, the first like 15, 20 minutes of that movie is like this biker gang movie, I guess. And then like once it gets deeper into its sci fi themes, it, it really starts digging into deeper questions and these sorts of things which are uh, super interesting so i often wonder with the american adaption of the movie if a lot of the the themes and stuff would get completely lost and then if they do if this anime is like a reboot or like a remake which it possibly could be or or even if it's a continuation i often wonder like these days because people just want to see fucking naruto shit with people just fighting for 20 minutes per episode or whatever else i'm like are we going to lose the nuance of like what remains of, uh, at the core of this this product? So, I mean, uh, I'm excited to learn more, but at the same time, I'm not going to be jumping up and down just yet because I have low faith in it just because of, I'm not the biggest fan of a lot of highly popular anime properties, I guess. <laughs> I guess. So I'm like, how's this going to work out? Cool. Nick, do you have any feelings about Akira? I remember watching it many many years ago and thinking it was meh but i've been meaning to revisit it so yeah it is my it's uh my go-to movie for testing uh sound as well if i set up a new sound system or a headset or anything like that i test it with this movie interesting yeah i remember having to watch it for university back in the back in the day uh i've got still got the dvd copy i haven't watched it in years though so uh, Coming soon, or what do you? What do we end up? What? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, we'll see. All right, that brings us to the end of this news segment for this episode. So, Dylan, what do we end up watching this week? The apartment. Dressing for dinner? You know, just come as you are. Say, you're pretty good with that racket. You should see my back end. Where'd you see me serve the meatballs? Mildred, he's at it again. Yes, The Apartment, directed by Billy Wilder, starring Jack Lemmon, Shirley MacLaine, Fred McMurray, McMurray? Fred McMurray, I'm going to go with, uh, which tells the story of insurance worker C.C. Baxter, who lends his Upper West Side apartment to company bosses to use for extramarital affairs. When his manager, Mr. Sheldrake, begins using Baxter's apartment in exchange for murdering him, Baxter is disappointed to learn that Sheldrake's mistress is Fran Kubelik, the elevator girl at work whom Baxter is interested in himself. Soon, Baxter must decide between the girl he loves and the advancement of his career. Uh, so, it is true, this movie is mentioned in Stranger Things, uh, is listed as one of uh, Robin's top three films at the end of the season. <gasps> Spoilers. Um, but the thing that actually did bring it up in my mind is when I went to see Spider-Man Home, Far From Home, <laughs> they were doing uh, re-screenings at this at the cinema as part of like a promotional oh, classics thing. Was too. Yeah, I was wondering what brought you to it, but okay, yeah, I, they, yeah. they walked past. Also, the post- this is a much different tone to everything we've been watching recently. <laughs> Well, I picked a look. Fucking last week, I I literally pick a drama, and you're like, oh, it's still kind of a horror movie because it has an intense scene in it. Just because it has an intense scene <laughs> does not make it a fucking horror movie. Jesus Christ! It was pretty horrific. The oh White Nationals. Oh my Nationals. god! That's it. We'll it's watch your mother next horrific. episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah. So. Of course, this film from back in 1960, black and white, directed by Billy Wilder, um, won the Academy Award that year, is ranked number 20 on the AFI, uh, which is the American Film Institute, top 100, uh, I guess, comedies. I guess it's AFI's 100 Years, 100 Laughs. It's ranked number 20. Uh, Nick, is it a good movie? 
I'm in two minds about this. I enjoyed parts of this movie. I think the script was really tight and the delivery was good, but I just couldn't get past the of the timeness of it where something happens to the character and old mate's main concern is don't embarrass old mate. Don't don't let news get out about him and I just couldn't get past that. It's just so of the time and just took me out of it. But yeah. I mean it's a fine movie. I enjoyed it. I could see it at the time being quite good, but through a modern context I just couldn't get my head around that part. No, that's that's a fair criticism. Uh Dylan, do you have thoughts on the film? Hopefully. Um Hopefully. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Um, you have opinions about everything else, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I um yeah, I I really enjoyed this. I, I was I actually feel like out of a lot of all like sixties or early early seventies, sixties, fifties films, I honestly feel like this holds up pretty well, apart from a few things. Like that, uh, there's always gonna be things of the time that you're like, uh, that's you know, kinda weird to watch now or, or whatever. But I feel like the stuff that's in this is minuscule compared to a lot of other stuff that I wasn't having too much of a, a problem with it pulling me out. Like, I remember there was the one part where fucking someone walks out of the elevator and, like, slaps uh, Shirley McLean's ass or whatever, and that's supposed to be a, a big joke and, oh, 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 all this sort of stuff. I'm like, yeah, cool, cool, cool story. How about you sue him for sexual harassment in the workplace? But, like, we didn't, you know, like, <laughs> you're, you're watching it now. It's like, oh, you're so, let's all laugh about that. Um, I feel like it's a pretty progressive because she actually reacts to it. Whereas, yeah, but no one does shit. Everyone else in the elevator is like, because she's like, you do that again. I'll do that. If someone did that to that, you'd be like, um, you're f- going to get fired because I'll go to HR. And like, but he was HR. That was a th- <laughs> sexual harassment. Oh, no, he wasn't. But No, that guy wasn't there. No, well, there was a bad man. He was, but- the- he-, he was in touch with the guy on HR. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so uh, I don't know. That was that, that was one scene that stuck out because I'm like, you, you wouldn't do a joke like that now, obviously. No, I mean you wouldn't do that now, full stop. But you wouldn't do a joke about it now, even. Um, you wouldn't do a joke about uh, it if he was making a movie in like the 60s. I don't think that could that would work as long as he gets a come up at the end, which he didn't. So yeah, that's true. Um, what's the comeuppance? He gets punched in the face, I guess. Like yeah, if he gets his thing, but then it's not. It's, it's not really a joke. It's more of a Learn your lesson. A you're plot bad, device. You're bad More than joke. Yeah, yeah. But this was like, oh, 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 oh look. Um, but no. Uh, so Jack Lemmon play- is absolutely fantastic in this movie, and I think he's the reason that this movie is so good. Uh, Shirley MacLaine is also uh, quite good, but I would say Jack Lemmon is the, the the leading force, and his his comedic talent really just leads this movie and i was quite shocked and this is a of the time thing as well i think is with, with how long they'll let some jokes play out or like like even at the start of the movie where he's flicking for all these tv channels and they they do like a five minute build up just to be like oh they're playing ads again like on the tv or whatever or even um when he sits down at the workstation and he has to ring all the this is like in the first half hour or whatever again we have to ring all the numbers to organize all the people to switch days so he can like apartment days and he's ringing all these people I'm like this is a very long playing out thing and i i honestly don't feel like they would have a a scene like this play out the way it is now in comedies because it would just be too slow no like they just it, text it, like each that, other. It, yeah well, all that it would be it would be faster cut you know like yes. beep beep and there'll be side screens and whatever else like but this is like bit hang up fire beep beep bring all the people it's, it's very uh a lot slower and um i mean the movie's two hours for a start for a fucking comedy romance you know what comedy romance is gonna be two hours today none they're all like 90 minutes because people's yep. attention spans are, uh, uh, are a lot worse than whatever else but um he's really great in this uh he has this certain because because the thing is like he's a good he's a good guy at heart i guess but at the same time i'm watching and i'm like well you, you guys are a bit of a douche for like well not even well, i don't know it's a weird thing because i'm like just fucking say no stop just getting you're kind of getting bullied here and, and then you're like yeah. causing all these issues and like uh and it's kind of weird to watch a, this movie like where someone i mean we we'll have to go on spoilers but uh shannon mccain's character does something that's quite dark and it's not probably as big of a i mean it's a it's part of the plot but at the same time it's like not as treated with as heavy 
seriousness as I suppose I would expect it to be. It was more of a, oh, that, you know, it happens. People do it all the time. Like it's a, a bit of a joke or whatever else. But uh, the performance was were really great all over. And generally, I really quite enjoyed the movie. And I, I laughed several times. So, yeah, um, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. I thought it was very well acted. Uh, again, uh, Jack Lemon, very impressive. I hadn't seen. Obviously, I haven't seen a lot of older stuff uh, because I haven't seen anything past when we all met together. Um, uh, but I, <laughs> I <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, there were a couple of scenes that really got me emotional. Uh, especially, obviously, that scene where he discovers that she's the mistress. I guess. Um, th- yeah, I thought they had good chemistry, good rapport. Uh, I enjoyed their banter, like at the start, where he's obviously telling her about her day, and they're bantering in the elevator and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I thought it was it. It just at times felt long, which I guess is a thing of the times. Yeah, they were just yeah. Nowadays, a lot of stuff would be cut and edited down to be quicker. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's just just the premise in general. Why didn't he tell his neighbors that what was really happening? I guess maybe you get chucked out of the building. The, pre- the premise alone. Well, it, it is days. a very sexually repressed time as well. That's before true. Before the seventies sexual revolution and all that. True. Uh, yeah. Also interesting. It only takes place in like over a week. I think. I would imagine it's a very short time period. That it all no, because there's there's one point where he comes in and um, he says something about like, "Oh, you've been ignoring our calls for a couple of weeks," or, or, well, or something like that. All, all the, the guys come into his like office. Christmas. So. The bulk, of, yeah, the, 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 like there's the first half of the movie is like is this a, a Christmas heap movie? Of period, hey, is this well, a Christmas yeah, movie? I suppose <laughs> by, by the time it gets to the end, it's Christmas, so sure, technically, I guess, yeah, yeah, I I think it's pretty solid. I don't know if it's like the greatest comedy I've ever seen, but I guess it's it's one of those ones that ages. Um, I guess we can kind of get into spoilers, uh, for this movie from 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, almost 60 yeah I thought it was obviously she attempts suicide halfway yeah. through the film um, not super addressed by anybody or hit like that is something you would report to people and probably take them to the hospital I'd imagine rather than just get their stomach pumped and that's the end of it well yeah I guess different time I guess that's true it's um, like a sh- it's a shameful thing you don't want your family to find out and all that kind of stuff and yeah I don't know the the whole the his whole I can't embarrass the boss nobody can find out about this protect him and his marriage all that kind of stuff is just yeah it just really I don't know I just couldn't get past that part yeah that's probably the biggest thing that's changed nowadays most people yeah. would say that, fuck the, it <laughs> the the hang up of the the her trying to commit suicide that not being tr- treated serious is was one of my biggest hang-ups and kind of from that point on throughout the movie i couldn't get over it i guess like it was co- constantly thinking about it because and also you know it is of the time and but we can't help but talk about these things obviously but yeah. these days we talk a lot more about mental health and whatever else and how important it is to, to talk about it and not treat it like a you know something to hide and whatever else so it's like you've got this woman fucking literally trying to kill herself and it's like, oh, she'll be fine. Just pump the stomach and uh, just watch her for a couple of days. Make sure she doesn't do anything else crazy. And, you know, it'll, it'll all be fine. Girls are crazy. Hey, you know, women. Huh? Like, so. Well, he said um, he was. He tried to kill himself once. I don't, I don't ended know up how shooting true himself that in the was. Or, if it, or it was just a way to make her feel better. Yeah, I, He I showed her the scar. Very, no, you never saw it. I never saw well, it. Well, you can't tell because. It's no, because he goes to show her and she says no. Even if it is I don't, true, it doesn't. That, doesn't I don't know if you risk that. For it. Yeah, I don't know if you would have called that bluff. <laughs> also, this movie definitely wouldn't p- t- uh, pass the Berthendahl test. So, uh, she. Th- I mean, th- I mean, that's old movies from the time, I guess. But every time I watch one, I'm like, okay, literally, the, 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 everyone else is talking about everything. The the female character only ever talks about the men and. Um, then she kills, tries to kill herself over a man, and then she gets back with the man. Then she leaves the man for another man, and, and th- that's the the plot of the female character. Full stop. True. Yeah. Uh, One thing I found particularly comedic, but probably wasn't intended at the time, was 
how the doctor treated her. Cause the, oh, the that slapping? Was, that, yeah, that, that was that would have whack, been completely whack, whack. standard at the time. <laughs> but <laughs> knowing how far medicine's current, he's just there beating the shit out of her. Just, <laughs> I was struggling with that scene to take it. Yeah, that was that was quite odd. I'm like, I mean, it wasn't one slap. The first slap was like, oh geez. Then it was like whack, whack, whack again. It was like, wake up, wake yeah. the fuck up. <laughs> you could tell it wasn't filmed with to be a more dramatic tone. Then what? What we? I don't know. Maybe it was. It <laughs> maybe it was. I don't At know. At the time, that was super serious. Yeah, yeah. maybe it was. The I most graphic ever depiction of someone getting their stomach punked. Um, yeah, I, I was. I don't know. I think I would have liked, possibly liked the ending. Just ending with them going their separate ways, rather than ending up together. Like, mm. I thought that would have been an interesting way to end it, but obviously, they go the, the more trademark. They end up pet together. Famous last line. Yeah. Was it? Shut up and deal. Just shut up and deal. Famous uh, movie quotes. Yeah. Never heard it before. <laughs> probably would have in stuff. It's been probably. It's quoted and stuff. You it's probably, probably just quoted. You just, it it's from. so. It's not like epic or anything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been the apartment. And that's also been this episode of What Do You Want to Watch. Uh, Nick, where can people not find you on the internet? You find me on Instagram at Skull and Burns Barbecue. <laughs> and on Track TV at Lord and Pariah. Uh, Dylan, where can people find you? Uh, all the places, Viva La Dilla, V-I-V-A-L-A-D-I-L. Awesome. And you can find me at Ashley Hobley, A-S-H-L-E-Y, H-O-B-L-E-Y on Twitter. You can also follow, follow the Explosion Network, which this is a part of, at Explosion Pod. You can go to YouTube.com slash Explosion Network. Check out our review discussions of the before mentions, Spider-Man Far From Home and Stranger Things. Or just go to uh, ExplosionNetwork.com to find all our written reviews, all our review discussions, all our other podcasts, all the content. It's all there. Uh, if you've got any questions, send us an email at mail at ExplosionNetwork.com. And leave us a review, either on Podchaser, on Apple Podcasts, or just tweet us your reviews. We'll retweet them. You'll feel good. It'll be really impressive. Or just tell your friends and family that listening to our podcast is better than getting your stomach pumped. Wow. Uh, wow. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> uh, and until next time, keep watching stuff, I guess. Every trophy counts, or at least that's what Dylan would like you to believe. Join him and me every Tuesday when a shiny new episode of Platinum Explosion dings into podcast feeds. The number one PlayStation podcast in the Yoshi I know is breaks down all the latest in PlayStation related news, releases, trophy lists, and much more. Just search your podcast app for Platinum Explosion and subscribe for free now.